Hello there, thank you for staying with us and welcome to another edition of Channel's Beam. I'm Victor Mathias. Now, though marks to be celebrated on March the 8th every year, women are already being celebrated before the D-Day arrives. Now, the 8th of March is set aside to celebrate the social, economic, cultural and political achievements of women. It is also a day set aside to call to action for accelerating women's equality in Nigeria, in Africa, and even globally. So on the program today, we will be looking at issues hindering women from getting equal opportunities in the society and how they can be tackled moving forward vis-a-vis -vis this year's theme, Breaking the Bias. And joining us to look at this, we have in the Lagos studio with us, Mercy George Bafe. She is a self-taught educator, an agile and data enthusiast with expertise in business analysis, project management, and digital marketing. It's a pleasure to have you on the show today. Thank you very much for having me. Of course. And we also have joining us uh, via Zoom from Abuja, we have Saada Tu. Um, she is the managing partner of Hamu Legal, an innovative multidisciplinary firm based in Abuja. Her practice is focused on the intersection of law, policy, and emerging technology. It's a pleasure to have you on the program today, um, Saada Tu. We also have Buki Shonibara. She is the founder of Invictus Africa, a social enterprise working to close inequality gaps affecting vulnerable and disadvantaged people through evidence-based advocacy and collaborative actions. It's a pleasure to have you both on the show as well. Thank you. Of course. So, kickstart the conversation for us, Mercy. Um, you know, how, how do you key into this year's theme of breaking the bias? Breaking the bias, that's the theme. You know, a lot of us come into the space with biases. Oh, women should be left in the kitchen. Women should be cook. Women should be mothers. Women should not be business owners. Women should not be in the tech space. And that has actually put a serious limitation on many women on aspiring for greatness. I'm a tech person. Um, as the founder of Lentor, one of the things that we're big at is trying to close the gap in terms of the number of women that come into the tech space. I know the struggle I have, um, and I know the access men have. I don't have that, simply because, number one, I'm a woman. So that bias has already put a limitation on how far I can go. I'm sitting on the board of an international organization today because of the skills that I have. So if only many women know how brilliant, how talented, how industrious, how agile mindset they are, mm. then learning the nuances that make them who they are would help them to stand out. So okay. this is some of the limiting barriers, the biases that men come to the table with. You go to compete with a man, he gets favor over a woman just because they feel you don't have a voice. You shouldn't have a voice because of the patriarchal structure that Africa has found herself. All right. Um, I hope that changes pretty soon. But let me also um, uh, try to get um, um, Buki's feel on this. Buki, how, do you, how, how are you keying into this? And how do you um, intend to ensure that the bias is broken? I mean, the guest at the studio has actually laid a very good background. Um, but let's even dig deep in, into the word called bias. By bias, you mean some form of inclination or prejudice, you know. And in this case, because we are relating it um, to women, it's simply those gender norms that we see, um, you know, that is prevalent in the society, where society seems to, um, in their bid to ascribe certain um, roles or responsibilities to women. Um, women are considered to be, you know, you should, a woman should be in the kitchen, a woman should be the one to stay at home. You know, so all of these biases, um, when we look at how it has formed us into a patriarchal society, it gives you an idea of how indeed women continue to suffer um, from one form of um, discrimination or the other, the discrimination on the basis of gender as it relates to whether citizenship, indigenship, whether political participation, um, whether participation even in general leadership positions. So these biases are there. And what this March 8th International Women's Day is saying is that we have to break these biases. And I'll close my thoughts by saying that with the injustice and the basing legalization of um, 
gender inequality um, that was perpetrated by our lawmakers in Nigeria on March the 1st. It means that we must also break the constitution bias. Thank you. Oh, well, well, how can that be done? Uh, of course, I know that there was a protest that was carried out, of course, in regards to the, the constitution bias that you're talking about uh, uh, on what happened on March the 1st. And I know there was a protest, but going past that protest, what else can be done to break that constitution bias? I think it is important because what makes it into law, laws usually are a representation of the ideals or the principles that any society owes there to. So what becomes law in our society and may not become law in another society, maybe because you know um, that particular society does not hold that ideal. Um, so for us, having the constitution as the apex law means that we are putting as that apex law certain um, gender equality um, norms. So in order to break that constitution bias, um, it is important that first, let's even the low and gain fruit, the legislators, whether the upper chambers or the lower chambers, need to reconsider those five bills that were rejected and make sure that they are passed as soon as possible. We've seen it done in Nigeria. I think that would be the first step for our lawmakers to say that they are indeed shaping a constitution that supports you know, gender equality in Nigeria. And beyond the legalization of gender equality, I think it is also important that we continue to change people's mindset. We continue to change the, these biases and prejudice that seems to be stacked against women. And that is a responsibility of you and I, the gate man, the driver, our bosses, who seem to believe that women, you know, should be relegated. We need to one-on-one -on -one continue to change these biases and prejudices against women. And until then, we may not have a society that really supports women and gender equality. Oh, we can't wait for that to happen. But let me quickly get uh, Sara to um, take on all of this that has been said. Uh, Sara, too, of course, uh, you've listened to uh, Mercy as well as Buki. You know, give us uh, a sneak peek into what their thoughts are on the theme of this year's um, uh, so, um, the theme of this year's International Women's Day. But in your own perspective, you know, going by all that they've said. Uh, of course, we know women, you know, they might not have all of the opportunities that they deserve, they, they deserve but we have women here and there in many, in various positions as well. Uh, but obviously more needs to be done. So in doing more, in having more women, you know, having women have equal opportunities, what, what do you think can be done? Um, of course, the constitution part has also been made mention of. Uh, what more, what other areas do you think uh, work has to be put in to ensure that this equality comes into place? Thank you very much, Victor. And thank you so much, um, Buki and Mercy, for laying a fantastic um, groundwork. Well, for this year's theme, in terms of breaking the bias, whether conscious or unconsciously, I think we as human beings have um, prejudices that ha whether have by the way the societies have been structured for eons of years before me and you were even born, um, that exist in the way the workplace has been designed, in the way the home structure has been designed that, for instance, has sort of seeped into our working lives. And I think the first thing in terms of breaking the bias is being making sure that wherever we stand, wherever we work, what decisions are we making that ensures that women have a seat at the table, that the needs of women are also being addressed. When we start from that perspective, it begins to change the mindset of each and every person around us. And moving towards the laws, of course, when you begin to, laws like, uh, I think it was Mercy who mentioned, or Buki, that is a reflection of the ideologies of the thinking of the people within the society, of course, for where we stand now as women, there is a need for a certain level of affirmative action towards the inclusion of women in the political decision-making processes in the business space as well, because I think Messi referenced how difficult it is for women to get into the tech space or even have access to financing. We've seen how affirmative financing, at least in the financing industry, has worked, where the CBN mandated that commercial banks must have, at this, I think it was 30% women within their boards. And by that singular action, we've had major banks now have CEOs, have female CEOs um, leading them. So I think it's taking a decision and taking steps within each sector that we operate in 
that breaks down that bias and also continuously engaging with our legislators to ensure that these rules and this set of policies that we are designing accommodate the women in today's world, not in yesterday's, uh, not in yesterday's world. Because frankly speaking, if you bring forth um, you bring forth a bill that addresses the needs and interests of women, and you have barely 20 women that could boldly speak to it compared to the over 400 men, definitely we are already in trouble. So for the political parties as well, as we continue to forge towards the legislative and constitutional amendments to our laws, the political parties also have to make conscious decision, what are we going to do to ensure that we have an increased participation on, of women as we present them for running for political office. That is when we'll ensure that when we present this bill next time in the House, when we continue to advocate and lobby amongst these issues, um, it, passed, it passes through. We have other women who are also protecting or pushing forward our interests. Not that we're saying the men are not doing, but it is not enough. And we have phenomenal women across the country. Yeah, so, I mean, there are, there are many women, of course, uh, you know, in those positions, like you said. Uh, we have bank CEOs, you have ministers, you have some in the House of Representatives, I think a few in the Senate, and we have all of you as well. But how would you say, or how would you rate the rate at which those in power are trying to pave the way for more women, you know, to join them, you know, upstairs? How are, could you repeat the question? Yeah, how would you rate the, the, the manner in which those in power, the women in power or in, in places of, of, of um, authority, you know, are trying to pave the way for more women to join them where they are? I think the fact that we're even having this conversation in 2022 and the fact that we have five bills before the National Assembly addressing the needs of women is indicative that the role of the women have been playing. And the fact that there has already been a ripple effect in terms of board, um, CEO appointment, at least in major commercial banks, it's clear evidence of a ripple effect. I think I'm more keen not just beyond what women are doing, but beyond more focused on what are the structures doing? What are the institutions doing to ensure that their systems have shifted? Because the reality is we are just a drop in the ocean in whatever space that you go into. So if you have a drop in the ocean, your efforts before they reach 100 is going to take, I don't know, maybe a thousand years. But if you are a man and you, 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 your efforts, of course, will be amplified and multiplied because you have other advocates that will be supporting you. I think what has been done so far, I think the advocacy that has been carried out by not just women who are in the spaces of power, but civil society organization has helped us to get to this point. Because in the history of Nigeria's democracy, there's never been a point where we had five bills addressing the issues of women have been tabled and quite embarrassingly so, all of them shut down. So I don't think, I don't want to even look at what the women are doing. It's just yeah. so unfortunate to see that the men are not doing enough. Wow, that's uh, shots fired now, let me just put it that way. But I'll hold you there for a bit. Mercy, you were nodding your head. I don't know you know, what it was in your mind, but it seems you were concurring with what they were saying. Yes, I but Correct do. me if I'm wrong. Uh, yes, I do. And besides that, one of the questions you asked is, how are we helping more women to get into the space? Yeah. I think it's about time more women add their voices and not cow behind, okay? We hide behind our wigs, our looks, our work. We're not really at the forefront. I want to celebrate the women that led the protest to NAS and protested against the bill. But besides that, it's time for women to get into tech, where their voices can be heard, where you can equally use technology to drive a lot of decisions that you need to make. What are the skills a lot of women need to start to learn? Skills like design thinking, data analytics, business analysis, machine learning, AI. Mm. I'm sure you've heard of the metaverse. All of the skills are begging for women to come into the space. But oftentimes, when we launch out training, we see that many women don't get involved. But once they plug in and they are exposed to the space, they run with it. So in the pos uh, position of political power, getting relevant, you need to come out. In the position, we women, we need to fight against some of the prejudices, imposter syndrome that has held us back and that we will not give us that competitive edge. It doesn't matter how many times I'm told no. People don't even take me seriously. Many men, I talk to them. If a guy goes to them, they will take them seriously. 
And that's part of what she was saying that we need to break those biases in the sense that men need to do more by listening to male women when they speak because the experience we bring to the table is not like of the men. We are futuristic in the way we deal with things. So imagine a lot of women in the tech space where decisions are being made. Okay, if a few women are made CEOs of bank today, we need more women in other area of industry, another sector where your voice can be heard, where you can be called a decision maker. Like she said, we're like a drop in the ocean. And even when you speak, you, you see smock, laughed at you. So these are some of the biases that men need to break. Women too need to break them themselves, not to limit them. And that's why I told you earlier before the show, as part of me supporting more women, I'm willing to support one woman to take one of our tech courses, which costs a lot. I don't want to go into the cost, mm -hmm. but for free as a way of lifting another woman. I believe we rise by lifting others up. And so more women need to come into the space. Yeah. I'm alone. I feel very lonely. Well, well, <laughs> I, I hope you, you don't, you don't, you don't, uh, you know, continue to be lonely for you know <laughs> that much of a time. Let me just hold you there for a, for a bit. We'll take a quick break, and we'll be back with more discussions on this. Please stay with us. Many thanks for staying with us. We still have with us our guests right here in the Lagos studio as well as via Zoom from Abuja. Um, but um, just before we went on break, you know, you, you were talking about how you wanted to, you know, put more people to join in this space. But let's uh, look at the sensitization. Do you think there has been a lot of sensitization in terms of, you know, breaking the bias? Um, there's been a lot of campaign, but I just hope it doesn't end on social media alone. Because we speak, a lot of the thing I see, we trend on Twitter for one or two days and we forget about it. And we don't realize that the conversation continues. I need to engage with these beautiful women that are on the show today. It should not end here. Yeah. We need to carry on the conversation and educating. Why are we doing this conversation? To educate the average woman that is at home watching today that has never heard the word tech watching today that has never heard the word business analysis, watching today that has never heard the word data analytics. This career alone, a woman sits in the house. You don't even have to go anywhere. Mm. You can be earning dollars real time at home, learning the skills. You are empowered financially. The dependency that you've created on a man is taken away. The need for you to say, I need to depend on a man for my bills to be paid is taken away. So there are opportunity, an array of opportunity in the tech space. Yeah. And this is a career that you never retire unless you choose to retire. Yeah. And that's why for me, it's a pain point. And I'm willing, like I told you earlier, to support one woman because it's quite expensive to take on the next cohort that we have. Gim, I mean, they say um, a journey of a million miles begins with a what? step. Exactly. Um, but let me go back to Zoom. Uh, let me get uh, your thoughts on this. Um, uh, so, other two. so she's talking about, you know, education and, you know, educating people, sensitizing people and all of that. So I want to quickly bring in, you know, the statistics, uh, you know, of out-of-school children. And, of course, we have also a number of, of girls, a high number of girls as well. Um, but what can be done, you know, to ensure that that number is reduced, especially the, the female child, girl child now, uh, to first of all have that basic level of education before they can even advance it, you know, to a particular field that they, they might desire to, be it tech, be it law like yours, you know, or, or even advocacy like, 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 like bookies. We can't hear you, sir. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, fantastic. So in terms of um, reducing the number of out-of-school girls and improving literacy for girls and women, I think overall, there are very low-hanging fruits and quick wins we can, we can um, look at. So technology, of course, it's not an end in itself, but it, it's, it's, it's an amplifier. Of course, we could try to focus on how do we ensure that 
we give people in remote access um, access to technology because it's one thing for us to advocate for more tech inclusion if you can you don't even have internet to connect or the pricing is very very high or you don't even have the 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 teaching is not done in a language that you understand so we have to be able to break down these systems in a way that access is also very very easy and then secondly when it comes to the tertiary education we've had issues in the last two years i think on sex for grades we may not recognize it but i think this has is having an impact on how women feel in term, in terms of their safety within universities um, when interacting with their lecturers amongst other things so there are active steps the educational system needs to do to ensure that one women feel safe two access is democratized irrespective of where your location is using um, technology and also how do we ensure that because there is nowhere offering night school in, in this country that I'm aware of. There are several women who are interested in also still going within classrooms to learn. How do we begin to think of, how do we, how do we begin to think of systems or processes that create, even if it's night school or morning school, a certain type of systems that ensure that when kids are in school, women are also able to, to, to learn. So it's creating systems that are designed for our own peculiar situation and using it to amplify access to education. All right, um, Buki, let me also get your thoughts now. I mean, as we wind down the conversation, um, you know, I know earlier on I was, I was asking Mercy some certain things and I, I was figuring that you would, you know, quite be interested in answering that as well. Um, if you'd go ahead on that. Yes, um, so I was going to say that it is unfortunate that we live in a deeply um, ingrained patriarchal society. Because what that means is that we live in a society where it is not just men that discriminate against women, but women also in certain cases discriminate against women. So what that means is that there is still a lot of work, you know, um, that, that needs to be done. But the, the key thing I wanted to say is that it's unfortunate that we have become a society where women have to struggle, have to fight, you know, um, for their rights to be recognized and, and, and respected and, and protected and fulfilled. Now, the implication of that is that, I mean, these are just five rights that we have talked about. It, the implication is that we keep fighting for every right that should be fundamental and given. Now, my closing thoughts, on that would be that if we indeed say women's rights um, are human rights and human rights are women's rights, then our lawmakers need to be reminded that Nigeria is bound by the 1948 Universal Declaration on Human Rights. Now, what that means is that there are certain laws like the ICCPR, the ICESCA of 1966 that was developed. These are fundamental rights that also you know, are binding on women. Now that places an obligation on Nigeria as a country. And that is why Nigeria, for instance, is a party to CEDO and, and the Maputo Protocol. Now we didn't just sign these laws. We don't just have the UDHR, the ICCPR or the ICESCA. It places an obligation on Nigeria as a state to use its national laws to promote gender equality. And that is why we are hoping that national laws like the constitution and subnational laws like state laws, like the VAP Act, for instance, can be used as an instrument, you know, to promote gender equality. And I think that we really need to push, we really need to push that. We must not be yeah. a society where women need to keep fighting and struggling until every right is recognized. All right, Buki, in 30 seconds, what would be your pledge, you know, for this year before we come to next year's celebration? What would be your pledge? My, my pledge is that I will keep breaking the bias. I will keep breaking constitutional bias, legal bias, gender bias in any work that I do, whether my work as a consultant or my work in my, in my NGO at Invictus Africa, or even in my everyday relationship with people. Every gender bias that I see, I will do my best to change it and to break it. Until then, we will have a society that respects gender equality. Thank you very much, uh, Buki Shonibare, for joining us today on the show and sharing your thoughts on this. But started to also, before I let you go, what would be your own pledge? I think I'll 
think my pledge is to break the bias um, within the system I'm operating, which is the legal system, um, mm. to start with. And hopefully, we'll, by the time we come next year, we will not be debating why five bills were shut down. I can't wait for that to happen. Thank you as well for joining us on the show. Um, thank you, Buki, as well for joining us on the show and sharing your thoughts. Um, you've made a pledge already to yeah. to to you know sponsor one person you know to join the tech space as well. So I guess we'd leave it at that, and I'd say thank you for joining us on the show. Of course, that's the sign breaking the bias, but that's where it is. That's where we're going to leave the show today. Thank you so very much for watching. I'm Victor Mathias, and hopefully by the time we come back here next year to celebrate women, it will be a different ballgame entirely. Thanks for joining us, and bye for now.